Hi, everyone. Welcome back to those are who are returning and joining us again today. And welcome to those of you who may be joining us for the first time. This is Perennia's third webinar of the Idea to Market series provided to you by the Agri-Food Funding Program. Today, we will be learning about essential plans required for a new product launch. My name is Emily Page, and I'm a food scientist with Perennia Food and Agriculture. We offer a wide array of services to support Nova Scotia's agriculture and seafood sectors, such as food safety, agriculture extension, mobile wine bottling, and analytical testing of cannabis, foods, and beverages. Here at the Perennia Food and Beverage Innovation Center, we work with clients on product development, process improvement, nutritional labeling, and shelf life determination. Our guest presenter is Gary Morton of Morton Horticultural Associates. Gary has worked in agriculture for 40 years, helping farms and food businesses across Canada find new value, success, and profit from what they do. Today's webinar will make sure that you have the resources and effective strategies to target your customers, finance your project, develop markets, produce safe food, and monitor your sales progress. Lastly, just a housekeeping note for using Zoom webinars. If you have a question during the session, please use the Q&A button, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom window. I will be monitoring the questions throughout the webinar. However, most of the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar, along with the rest of the series, will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, so you can replay it later or share with your friends and colleagues who couldn't join us today. And with that, let's get started, Gary. Thank you, Emily, for that nice introduction. And thank you to Perenia for hosting this series from idea to market. Today, we'd like to, I'd like to talk with you about essential plans, but I'd like to do a quick recap of where we've come from in the last two sessions or two webinars that we've done before. The first webinar was about idea development, and we looked at the creative environment for finding ideas and where ideas come from and new product ideas. And then we looked at the idea scouting, how you'd actually go and find some ideas on your own for if you didn't already have one. We looked at the target customer because it's ideas come from um, usually from a problem that you're trying to solve for a particular customer, or sometimes you come up with an idea and then you're looking for customers to, um, to for the product uh, to work with. So it's important that the customer is a key aspect in the early stages of any idea development. And then there's idea screening as well. The next webinar we did was on product development. And from there, what we did is we took the ideas that you had and we turned them into a, a, a process to develop a prototype. And the prototype is what you need to take to the market so that you can validate your assumptions and to, to learn a lot more about that product. You can find out what uh, the customer thinks about it. Um, you can find out if there's a market opportunity for it. And the prototype is usually a very minimum viable product, something that uh, you can do quickly because there's gonna be lots of reiterations as you're moving along. The product's probably gonna change and what you start out with never really ends up with uh, the product that you're going to have to take to market in the end. We also looked at establishing price because it's important to look at the price of the products in the marketplace to make sure that your product can be competitive or you can actually produce the product for the price that uh, would be competitive. And then we also, finally looked at uh, getting help. Where do you get some help to help you develop that product prototype? And we looked at Perennia and some of the innovation labs that uh, are possible along like that. Essential plans today, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a business model and we're going to look at uh, the marketing and sales plan, the scale up plan and the food safety plan. Now there's probably many plans that you could be doing. And we don't want to over plan you here, but these are kind of the ones that I believe are some of the key ones to help you get on the right foot and uh, get your idea moving forward to the market. So just like we did in all the other webinars is we're going to start with why. New product essential plans are going to start with why, just like all the rest of them. So why plan? And that can be kind of a tough and profound question. And sometimes people don't even stop to think about it, but planning is pretty critical. There's, you've probably all heard this old adage, uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. And I know sometimes it's just sort of 
flows by or it's like water running off the duck's back that uh, we don't think about it too much, but it, it really has some profound impacts here when you're starting to look at moving forward because planning is a key to your success. If I was to use the analogy that um, in a seafaring province like we live in, if you went out in your boat and you were heading to some port, but you didn't have a plan of how to get there, then you're probably not going to get to where you thought you're going because my experience has been once you get a little bit away from the shore and you can't see the shore anymore, then everything looks the same and directions are, are all hard to figure out where you're going. And it's important to have a map or a plan of what you want to achieve and where you want to go, or you're probably not going to get there. And this is the one that I think is probably more important is if you don't have a plan of your own, then you become part of someone else's plan. What I mean here is that if you don't have a plan for what you want to do with your product, you'll find that there'll be lots of other people come along. Um, they'll be interested in helping you or they'll have all kinds of ideas which may take you in different directions or may distract you for a while. Your plan is what keeps you on track of where you need to go so you can be successful. The more you plan, the less the risk there's going to be, the more you're going to think about things and the better chance you're going to have of being successful in the long term. Planning is a discovery process. And I showed you this uh, little diagram probably in both of our past webinars. But you're really, you know, what you know is the bubble that you're in when you're starting into new product development. You know a fair number of things. You may be well versed in certain areas, but there's a lot of what you know that you don't know. You're, you're, you're in, you know that there's stuff out there in the next sort of layer that you're not really sure um, what it is or what, what, what are some of the answers to some of those questions out there, but you do know that they're out there. But then there's even layers beyond that, that you really don't know what you don't know. So the planning process is kicking the bushes, shaking the trees and finding out all the things that you don't know as you're going forward. Why don't they plan? Like a lot of people do not plan and the common things I've heard, I've probably heard most of these things over the years and it's too much work. It's a, it's a waste of my time um, to plan. I, I've got more important things to be making my product or I'm moving too fast and the plan will be out of date. And that's true. And I'll show you some ideas of uh, maybe some things you can do to plan that you won't be out of date or you can update as you're moving forward that don't take as much work and time. But Usually people will say that, you know, an hour of planning will save you 10 hours of uh, work on the other end. And there is some ratio in there that planning it ha does have value when you're starting to move forward with all this. Many are afraid of what they might learn if they sit down and go planning because they've moved along at a, a pretty rapid pace and they're scared that sometimes they might find some things that might mean that they should go back and start over again. And maybe they don't want to do that. There's also these knee jerk reactions to happenstance, the things that just happen like we, oh, stuff's happening so quickly. We just have to, we have to act quickly. And if we have to spend time sort of planning, that's going to be a problem. And then the other reason they don't plan is sometimes people just get busy chasing shiny objects and there's too many distractions and too many things happening and coming at them and they just don't plan as a result. On the other end, there's the over planners. And these are the people that know, must know every detail about everything. They count every nut and bolt and they look at every, every little tiny detail. They need certainty and guarantees, which is very difficult when you're going into new product development, because in most cases, if it's a unique or innovative product, you're going to go to territory that you've never been before. And no, maybe nobody's ever been there before. There are people that would have plan, they'll have plan A, but they'll also have plan B, C and D. And I think these are what some of the things that when you're going forward, if you have too many alternatives, then you don't get serious about the real plan that you need to have the plan A. Um, I think it was John F. Kennedy said that if, uh, if you focus on the second place, then that's where you're going to end up. And sometimes you do have to burn your bridges behind you a little bit and not, not have too many options to go forward. And it forces you to uh, be better on your, your, your plan A. Unnecessary project de delays get created when you start to focus on all the details and it just takes too long because you need to be moving at a fairly good clip 
The idea with planning is to, or new product development is to fail forward fast, like learn things, uh, reiterate, fix your product up, make it better, and then move forward and try it again and test it. It's a continuous cycle to do that. When you over plan, you get stuck in the shower and you naturally never really get in the game. So it kind of slows everything down for you. It's not about a plan document. Plans are nothing. Planning is everything, as Dwight Eisenhower said. You need to focus on three main things when you're planning. And there's three, con I call them three conflicts, basically, that a planner always has. There's the planning process. So all the things that you have to go through to um, create a plan or to what you're going to learn along the way. And you've got that information. Then you're trying to create maybe a document, a plan. And sometimes it's a very big plan or it can be a very simple plan, which I'm probably gonna share with you today that is, is good for when you're developing new products. And then there's the plan execution because you can go through the planning process, you can have the plan, but if you don't execute it and take action, then nothing really happens. So the planning process is where you learn things. The planning document is something that you can actually define and, and put a vision for that you can share with uh, investors and your team and all the people that you're working with. And the plan execution is where you take that plan and you the rubber hits the road and action happens. People often talk about a business plan or a business model. And at this point, you really don't need a business plan because if you're trying to do a formal business plan, at this point, you'd be doing a lot of guessing, you'd be making a lot of assumptions, and it'd be a lot of work that probably like, like people would said, well, it's, it's not uh, relevant anymore because things have changed as we're moving forward. What you need to do is to create a business model. And there's all kinds of models out there. And I'm going to share with you one of the models today. And the model helps you identify the interconnections and the relationships of the activities that are going to take place and the, and the different elements of your, of your new product development and the business that's going to be associated with it. And it's going to look at the key elements and those components and how they connect and how they work together and how they need to work together. It takes a holistic view of your plan and it starts to look at, because there are components, like there's a, there's a minor component, which is a management component. There's a production component, which is often called the grinder. And then there's a marketing component, which would be called the finder component. And all these play a role in your new model. This is the business model by Oswalder and Pigner. Um, it's a business model generation from their, or uh, example from their book. And it's one of the models that you could look at and use. And I like this one because it relates and connects all the different key components and elements that you need to look at creating and connecting and interacting with to have a successful product move forward into the marketplace. So I'm gonna share with you some of these components quickly over the next uh, little while here and we'll discuss those. So number one step is to look at that customer segment. Define the customer segments. These are the groups of people that you're going to target and you're going to serve. So we've talked about this in one of our previous webinars. Who are the customers uh, for this product and what, what do they want? And this is really so important to figure out from the very beginning. This is the first step. Who is this product for? Who are we serving? Who does it create value for? And we also have to consider that not all customers are going to be equal. You've heard the 80-20 rule, I'm sure, before, where 80% uh, of the customers are going to buy 80, or, or sorry, 20% of the customers are going to buy 80% of your products. So what you want to do in the very beginning, too, is to start to think about who's going to be writing the biggest checks to you, who are going to be those best customers, because you may want to focus on them a little bit more as you're moving forward. And which customer segments are you going to ignore, which are, is just as important as the ones that you're going to serve? Because your marketing and promotion efforts are really trying to repel the people that you don't want to come in as much as the people that you're trying to draw in. So there's aspects to all this. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. Step number two is a value proposition. And we've talked about this before as well, too. But your unique value proposition is the bundle of benefits your product offers to grab that customer's attention. So what makes this product special in the marketplace? What differentiates it? And this could be anything from price, the value to the customer, 
the uniqueness of the product in the market, the innovation that's associated with it. Maybe it's your packaging or their labeling, the customized service uh, solutions that you're offering again, the particular design, the branding that you use. The, it could be the cost, uh, the benefits, the warranty, the convenience, and how you're communicating this all as a package to the customer. So what you're trying to do in value proposition is what specific values are you promising that you're going to deliver to the customer? So this is really important when you start to go back and you think about who's that customer in that customer segment, then we have to look at what's the value that we're putting forward that we're gonna connect with them. And next, we're gonna look at the market channels, like, and these are the channels of how we get the product to the customer. And your business communicate, you know, how's your business gonna communicate with customers? How's that uh, unique value proposition going to get fulfilled? And really, how are these products delivered to the customers? And whether you're going to sell the product directly to the con end consumer yourself, or more likely, in most cases, you're going to have to access that customer through a channel of other people, which could be distributors and brokers and agents and wholesalers and retailers, and it could be, or it could be online. And there's, there's many different ways and market channels to get your product to the customer. And you need to find out which are the ones that connect up with that uh, target customer that you're going after. Where is the best channel or which is the best channel to reach those target customers? If we look at number four, customer relationships, these are the keys to success that uh, to retain your customers. And these are this is where you build trust. Like this is where you're going to continue to once you get your sales, you, you build the trust so that the people actually want to buy the product from you in the first place. You make your product relevant to them. And it's also the long-term things of the relationships that you're going to build and what's required so that you can actually retain them as long-term customers. In some cases, this means that somebody has to have an effort to be a salesperson. In some cases, you can have a more automated approach. And sometimes it's just you're fulfilling purchase orders once you've actually made those initial relationships. But sometimes people really need to have a salesperson calling on them all the time. So you need to think about that in the beginning with the product is what's required for this product. And then how will you reestablish those new customer relationships and retain those existing ones is, is so key, so important here, is that you don't want to waste a lot of time getting customers and then losing them out the back door. You want to keep your customers for long term. Revenue streams. <laughs> This is showing me the money. My plan is to show me where the revenues are going to come in and you need to know how much revenue you do actually need. Like how much do you need to make all this work? And you know, I'm developing a new product, but how much revenue do I need to make this business successful? And how am I going to generate cash from each of these customer segments that I choose to go after? You know, if I'm selling to direct to the end consumer, you know, how much cash can I generate there? I'm selling through uh, retailers or other um, um, leverage, leveraging others to the market. There's a cost to all that. So I actually may have to sell more product to make the same amount of money versus if I was selling direct. What are those revenue streams? And what are those revenue stream contributions back to you? So in each stream, what am I going to get? It'll determine how much product you need to make. It'll also determine how, um, how much is going to, how much you're going to, it's going to, you're, you can afford to spend to make this product as well. And how will we create a consistent regular cash flow out of these revenue streams? And this cash flow is king when you're starting to look at businesses and you want regular consistent cash flow. How are you going to do that? And that's what this part is looking at. Key activities. These are important actions to operate a successful, in a successful manner. And we're looking at supporting the delivery of the stated value proposition. We're trying to look at maintaining those key customer relationships. What are the activities required? What are the activities required to create the revenues that you need? And this could be things like your sales and your order fulfillment, your relationships you're gonna build with your customers, how you're gonna deliver your product to the market, your marketing, your revenue generation, as we mentioned, uh, your production capacity, quality, volume, efficiency. These are all things that are key activities that you need to do to be successful, to make your business successful. Key resources. And these are the assets that you need to make the business function properly and succeed. And they could be things like your, your facilities, your buildings, the equipment you need. Your team of people is so key when you're starting to look at things. There's so many people 
um, that are required in a business to uh, with skills to make things happen these days. The education and the training that would be needed. Um, how's the product going to be distributed? Your distribution um, network, intellectual property, and and you know another key resource is your financing. Like who's going to help you finance this product? And this we'll talk about this in the key partners probably here too. But what are the key resources required to deliver on your value proposition and to get your product to market? The key partners, and this is the network of everything from suppliers and stakeholders and people that uh, and businesses that make your model efficient and really functional and very successful if it all clicks and works together. So these can be things like agreements, relationships, strategic alliances you have to form, joint ventures to reach larger markets because initially it's not always easy to get there by yourself. And that's why the brokers and the agents and the wholesalers, they help you get into markets that you wouldn't be in otherwise. So who are your key suppliers in your value chain and what key resources do you acquire from these partners? And and how do they benefit you, these resources that they bring in? Because you don't want any more people in your value chain or your operating chain um, or your supply chain than you need. You want to keep it very lean and trim. So you need to think about those things as you're going through. And which key activities do they perform that you really depend on? Because sometimes these people in, in your chain, uh, you can't do without and you have to know who you need, you're depending on and what what is uh, what you can do to make sure that those partnerships stay strong. And then finally, we're looking at the cost structures. This is step nine. <clears throat> All costs involved in developing and running your business. And there's fixed costs, which are those are the ones that occur whether you, you know, you produce something or not. So if you have a mortgage in your facility, like you're going to have to pay that cost no matter what. But your variable costs depend on your production activities. So if you produce more product, th these costs are higher. If you produce less product, those costs are lower. So you need to understand these costs because they're all going to be going into your cost of production and they're going to be ultimately coming out in your pricing of your products and in your pricing formula. So a business model that positively impacts the cost of your operations can create really good economies of scale. So it's important to focus on your costs as your thinking about developing a new product and moving forward and taking it to market. And always you have to be looking at your costs. And what are the most critical elements that uh, within that business model? So you're always thinking about those critical elements. I'm gonna come back to this model that we started off with. And I'll show you the path that I was following here with it. We we're talking about looking at your target customers, which is number one in the yellow box. Then we went over to, you need to have a unique value proposition, which is in number two. Then number three, you're looking at developing and understanding the market channels that you're going to take to get to the consumer. Number four in the green box, you're looking at what are the customer relationships that we need to develop? Number five is the revenue streams. What kind of revenue streams are gonna be generated? Number six is what are the key business activities? Number seven, what are the key resources that we need? Number eight, what are the key partners? And who are the key partners that uh, are gonna make it successful? And then number nine is understanding the cost structures. Now you can actually put all of this on one page, this information, and it will be really helpful in, as you're developing your product and as you're developing your business to take your product to market, to make sure that you've got all the pieces connecting and interrelating and working together. If it changes, you can go back on one page and change that quite quickly until you're really confident that the formula is working really well. And that's at the point when you're probably going to need to have a more formal business plan because you're going to be taking that uh, idea or concept out to investors or lenders or people that are going to give you money to go forward. But in the beginning, using this business model diagram, it's very useful, it's very quick, and it's very easy to make sure that you're thinking about all the components that you need to, to be successful taking your product from idea to market. The next I'd like to talk about marketing and sales plan. And in the amount of time that we have, we're gonna to have to move through these things fairly quickly. All of these things that we're talking about could be, um, we could take deep dives into them all and, and go into them in a lot more detail. But for the time we have, we're gonna look at four key elements. And we're gonna look at the four key elements of marketing and sales is basically getting customers, converting those customers to sales, 
delivering on what is promised, like that's getting the products to the customers that you promised to send to them, and then retaining those customers for the long term. So I'm just going to take a few slides to look at those here. In this little cartoon, we're talking about getting customers. And it's probably one of the most important activities that you're going to do in, in the entire business. And sometimes people just don't focus on this anywhere near like they should. But attracting customers and drawing them in, there's many ways to go about it. You have many tools now. You have online tools and social media tools to create a, a, a interest out there. You have websites. But there's still the traditional advertising and marketing that is possible and uh, useful. But the main thing when you're promoting and marketing to um, find new customers and attract new customers is to make sure that you can measure what you're doing so that you're not pouring money down a black hole and you're not seeing results of them. It's super important to continually have new customers, but you also want to be careful that as we're going to talk about in retaining customers is you, you need to keep those customers for the long term as well. Converting customers to sales. What you need to think about here is uh, they only listen to one radio station. It's WII FM, those customers, and that's what's in it for me. And customers, if you can figure out what's in it for them, that's where you start to get those sales and you can work towards those sales. The benefits and features are what come into play here. Benefits are what connect up with a customer's heart and features are where their logic kicks in. Now the benefits I could say would be, for example, if someone uh, is looking at uh, buying a car and, and uh, we're looking at airbags in a car, for example, and we look at if the car had 20 airbags or 30 airbags or whatever the number that they're going to have, those are actually features of the car. And does it really matter whether there's 25 or 30 airbags in that car? I'm not really sure, but really the benefit that really connects up with the person is that when that car has a crash, there's enough airbags in there that it's going to save my life. And that's what really connects with people. The features are where the logic kicks in and they say, okay, well, you know, okay, we need those uh, extra airbags or we need more seat belts or we need some of the things like that. But the real benefit of all those features is that um, it's going to save someone's life. So that's the important part when you're starting to look at all of this and selling your product and you're selling the benefits and the features. Be careful that you're not trying to focus on the features first because if you put the features on up in front of your customer first, they're going to start using logic on it and you'll miss the opportunity to connect with their heart and then um, possibly they'll logic themselves out to another product. So you need to look at the benefits and features and what's in it for the customer if you're going to market your product or convert things over to sales. Deliver what promised. It's important that uh, once you're using, you know, your value proposition is basically saying, this is what we're going to do for you. Um, this is the product, what it does, all those kind of things. And it's important to follow up to make sure that what you're saying your product does, it does, and you're helping that consumer in the long run. It's also important that you get that product to those people and deliver it in a different way because um, sometimes it, once it leaves your hands and uh, it's going to the customer through some other people that can cause some problems for you that um, are unnecessary and maybe it reflects back on you and, and it's unfortunate, but sometimes that can happen. But deliver on what's promised. And then retaining your customers for the long term. When you start to look at what, why, why did people stick with their milkman forever when they, you're growing up, uh, when the milkman actually did come to the house, it was because there was a service associated with it. The milkman personally delivered that service to you. You felt important that the milk was coming right to your house. You didn't have to go to the store to get it. It was convenient. These are the things that retain people for the long term as customers. Your product can be the best product in the world, but if you're just focused on finding new customers and not keeping those old uh, existing customers happy, you'll find that you'll be constantly in this churn of trying to find new customers, which will end up being very expensive. Once you get a customer, it's so much easier to keep that customer and to um, keep them happy than it is to continually go out and find new customers. You'll see this at uh, so many businesses. If you think around uh, 
in your life, there's so many businesses that will spend a lot of money to get uh, a new customer or, or give you lots of gifts and lots of things. But then after they get you, they kind of forget about you. And uh, some of the technology companies that uh, we all deal with are, are very similar to that. So if you want to keep your customers for the long term and you want to build a nice solid business then retain your customers. I'm going to show like in the marketing funnel of how all this kind of connects here. The marketing funnel is where it's the process of flow to actually to a sale and to keeping those customers. So basically the first thing we talked about was attracting the customers. So that's at the very beginning because sometimes you don't know who your customers are. You're using social media, you're using your website or you're using advertising and you're attracting those customers in. Once they come in, they may come to your store, for example, or they may come to your website. And your job then is to merchandise and your selling people connect up with them to actually confirm um, the interest in the product and to um, finish the sale. Once that sale is done, the product has to get delivered. Uh, it gets out to the person's car. Um, you help them be satisfied with that product. You make sure that they're successful with that product. And that's what leads to keeping customers and retaining them for the long term. So this is the marketing funnel that you're going to need in your plan to build. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it's just you need to think about, okay, I have to attract customers. I need to sell to those customers. I need to convert those customers over to sales. I need to deliver on my promises. And then I need to keep those people for the long term because it's so much cheaper to do that than it is to attract new customers all the time. I'd like to quickly talk about branding um, um, here a little bit because it's an important thing to start building from the very beginning. If I said a, a green tractor, pretty much everybody's going to recognize it as a John Deere. And they've done an excellent job of branding their tractors uh, for the public and for most people. Here's an example of uh, somebody that's built a brand around a phone booth. And uh, Pete Luckett's uh, Vineyards in, uh, in uh, Gaspro. Wine's worth phoning home about. And he's built a, a pretty good little um, marketing brand around all of this because a lot of his wines relate to this. A lot of his marketing all relates to this. He actually has a phone booth in the vineyard that you can actually go in and make a call to somebody. So how many places have something unique like that? So how can I connect my product up with something really unique and memorable in the long term to build my brand? or it's putting the face of people on things. The grocery stores do this now to help build brands and to build loyalty with customers. Um, here you see Bruce Rand and you know, his picture, when you go into the store, it's near his products that he's selling. And that helps to build his own brand for his products. And it's really important, as I was mentioning, when you're thinking about a new product and, and you're moving that through, through that development phase, you start to think about, What's the brand we're gonna build around this? Because this is what connects you long-term, makes sales easier for you long-term, and it builds those loyal customers. Dave Bennett's uh, family farm here, he did it through organic meats. And for years, he's had uh, excellent following at the, at the farmer's market in Dieppe and excellent products, but he's built this brand around um, organic grass-fed beef. And I think when he first started looking at that, he didn't think that was possible, um, but it definitely has worked out good over the years. And then there's also online. When you're starting to think about marketing and promoting your products online today, there's so many things to consider. It's moving this way rapidly, um, faster than most people would think. So it's an area of marketing and promoting your product that you can't overlook, whether it's just promoting your product and you're getting them to buy it somewhere else or whether you're actually selling your products online. And there's many different tools and things out there to help you with this, but it's probably more than what we can talk about today. Your sales plan. If you don't set sales goals, they're just dreams. And it's true. This is the one that I think is often overlooked is the sales plan because the sales plan is where you set targets for how much you're going to sell. You don't just sort of open the doors and say, well, come on customers, let's go in. It's, a lot. it's work. You have to actually go out, do your marketing to get those people to come in. But then you also need these goals that you're setting so that you know how much I need to do. And if you have a sales plan and you say, I need to know how much I know how much I need to sell this year. 
I know I, how much I need to sell each month. I need to know how much I need to sell each week. It sort of filters back to this is what I have to do today to make sure that's happening. If you have the sales plan and you have the goals there, and if you're not reaching those targets, then you can actually make changes quickly to see if you can improve the sales. If you're doing better than you thought, then you actually can learn from what you've done and maybe kind of make your sales even better than you thought through the whole year. The sales plan is used to address sales uh, growth targets, so you're setting those targets. It also helps you like uh, figure out how products are to be sold, where you're gonna sell them, how much you're gonna sell and when you're gonna sell them, because sometimes you know, you're trying to manage production and the logistics of everything to make it work out that way. You're looking at who is the target customer um, because your sales plan is going to be targeting a specific uh, segment or group of people. It's going to be focusing and leveraging your competitive advantages, those differentiators that you have. It's going to address the obstacles that you have to success. It's going to think about your, your competitor's impact when you're planning and preparing your uh, sales plan. And your sales plan also needs to look at how you're gonna stay relevant with your customers. And this means maybe you have to do some promotions with them sometimes, or you have to do some in-store presentations or promotions or more advertising to keep them happy. How you're gonna promote those products through the, all those different channels. And then the key thing here is it's a measurement tool for your success. Because if you can't measure it, and if you don't set the goals and you don't measure them, then you probably don't get there. And you don't wanna to wait till the end of the year and say, well, we didn't sell as much as we thought we would. This way, you're gonna set the goals down and you're going to be able to follow them through and, and make sure that happens. It also moves you from an order taker to an order maker. And so many people kind of just get in that routine of, well, you know, these customers order this on a regular basis or whatever, but you really want to be in the driver's seat of with your sales plan of saying, look, I need to make these orders. I don't want to just wait to see what happens. I want to make these orders happen. I want to be more successful. I want to grow my business. The other plan that you really need to look at as well is the food safety plan. And it's really an important one. It's beyond my, most of my expertise here, but the reason I'm going to talk about it is that because whether you're selling uh, fresh products or you're selling uh, processed products, Food safety is becoming more and more of a big issue for people. Um, you need to have, have the food safety certifications that are required and to get into markets, you need certain food safety certifications. There are also competitive advantages for you if you use them. So what food safety regulations are relating to your product? You need to know those. What certifications do I need for the target markets that I want to go into? Who will manage that food safety protocol and paperwork? This is a big job, like uh, looking after the paperwork, because if, you know when audits come and things, you need to have all everything in place. So you need to have all these things planned out and well thought of, and it'll take so much stress off when you start to do these things. There's also provincial and federal food safety certifications. So which applies to me if I'm shipping outside the province, I may need federal inspection on my on my products. Whether I'm producing meat or, or vegetables may make a difference as well domestic markets versus export markets. And as you go to more markets and more advanced markets, your level of food safety requirements are going to increase. But in the end, you're starting to look at, is my product safe for the consumer? You wanna ensure that whatever you're producing in, in your new product, that's gonna be safe for that consumer because that takes a lot of stress off as well. So the food safety services at Apprenia uh, that are available, they have people to help you with assessments, they, do program development and coaching, public and private training, they recall and uh, recovery support, and they have facility process flow help as well. So there's lots of things that they can help you with. If they can't, I'm sure they can put you in the right direction to get your food safety plans uh, all set up. Now your final one here that we're gonna talk about today is the scale up strategy. And in our resources that uh, Emily's going to send out to you, if you've registered for this uh, workshop or webinar today. Um, there's gonna to be a scale up checklist in there and there's a number of resources that you'll find helpful to take you through um, some of the things that we've talked about. It'll have that uh, guide, will have the, uh, that business model in there and all the, all the points of the business model are explained in there as well. And the scale up strategy 
you know, the, the checklist that you're going to go through, um, making sure that you've got all the things in place to scale up. It confirms that you can actually make it and it explores some of those co-packing options that so maybe you don't have to have your factory and put all that investment in the beginning to reduce the risk. The questions that you're looking for uh, from your scale up uh, plan are, can you manufacture your product uh, a formula recipe at a commercial scale? Because sometimes the, the scale or the recipe that works at a small pilot scale, once you go to the commercial scale, it's not just a matter of doubling it or, or tripling it uh, to get to a commercial scale. You need to reformulate it to actually make it work. And a product uh, marketing and sales growth strategy, like, you know, as you start to grow and you're scaling up, like you also have to scale up your marketing and sales to continually to keep everything moving forward. Otherwise there's gaps. You'll be filling orders and there'll be a gap and there'll be filling orders and there'll be a gap. So you need to have those marketing uh, strategies and plans in place so that you can have some fairly um, smooth flow of production. And can you manufacture this product for a price that the market will pay? This is a key one. As you're starting to scale your idea to um, maybe a full processing line, you know, can we make it for the price that somebody is prepared to pay? And it's a key thing to explore in your scale up strategy. And can we meet those food safety requirements that we talked about before? How will you get your product from your loading dock to your customer? I mean, this, this is just one that, uh, you know, when it, you've just got a few products and they can go in your car and you can take them somewhere when you're starting out, that's one thing but how are you gonna get them somewhere um, economically and feasibly as you're moving forward? And can you cash flow this product to the market? Like I've mentioned this before, but you know, when you think about you have to buy supplies, you have to pay people, you have to pay rent, you have to pay utilities, you have to manufacture products, you have to get it to customers, you have to sell it to customers, um, and then you have to invoice those people. And then by the time you get money back, sometimes that's a long period of time. So you have to make sure that you've got the things in place to be able to finance your growth. And have you eliminated unnecessary risk? And that's what your scale up is, uh, plan is all about. And it doesn't have to be too complicated, but just you need to think about these things. I want to share with you uh, quickly, these are clients that I worked with for many years, uh, the late uh, Case Van Dyke and his wife, Reek Van Dyke. And they uh, created a product, uh, Van Dyke's uh, Wild Blueberry Juice. And it's a pure blueberry juice. And it was 25 years ago or more that uh, Case and Reek had come into my office and said, you know, told me their idea. And I had worked with them for a long period of time to help them develop their product. And I was mostly working around the planning side and Case was a really good planner. Like he planned out everything really well. He planned the different stages when he went to uh, every, every movement forward, there was a new plan kind of created as he went into a new market, it was researched and planned. And sometimes those markets didn't turn out and, and, uh, and there was a new plan done for a new market, but it was, it, if you look at the planning and if I look in hindsight, this was an example of really where a product idea went to market very successfully to market and to world markets now. And as you can see, I got the world juice innovation award in 2005 for the best new juice in the world. And it was all because of careful planning and taking the idea one step at a time and moving it forward to get to a successful future. I'd like to share with you this uh, little sheet quickly and just before we wrap up here, and Emily's gonna include this in the email that um, comes out to you as well, but I find this a really valuable tool and it's the observation action worksheet and uh, I call it my post-mortem. And it's after everything you do and in your planning processes and all the things, the little steps that you're doing, it's really important to go back and say, okay, when we were planning, what things worked really well? What are the things that are concerns that we need to address? And then how are we gonna do things better next time? And that's really the essence of planning. It's like, what things are working well? What things do we need to address? And how are we gonna do it better as we go forward? And if you think about these three things with each activity that you're doing, it could be as simple as every day in your business or whatever you're doing, you just sit down and say, what worked well? What are the concerns? What didn't work so well? And what do I do better tomorrow? And you'll find that incrementally, you'll get so much better, quicker.
quicker than you probably would otherwise. So I'm just going to leave you with this quote. It's uh, by Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra, the New York Yankee baseball player and, uh, and philosopher. He sometimes has uh, off the wall philosophy, but you can have, he said, you have to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you just might get there. And that's the essence of why we're talking about planning here today. You've got an idea, you're taking it to market. We want to make sure that you get to that market as successfully as you can. And if you don't know where you're going and you don't have a plan, then you just might not get there. So just a quick recap, we talked about business models today. We talked about marketing sales plan. We talked about the scale up plan. We talked about a food safety plan. So now we can take some questions, Emily. Yep, so if you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window now and we'll take the questions. Um, I did just wanna say quickly that I have gotten a couple inquiries about where the um, recorded videos are and they are on our YouTube channel. Um, we do have both first and second part up now live and um, I will include that in my email, a direct link to that playlist today. Um, so my email this afternoon will have a link to uh, where the videos are located on YouTube and um, all of the resources. So while we're, while we're waiting for a question, uh, maybe just buzz forward to next week's um, webinar is Aim and Fire. And it's talking about the launch sequence. It's going to talk about growing your sales once you actually are in the marketplace. And it's going to talk about making your product better, uh, continually making it better going forward and growing that business. Because how I've talked about this, um, you know, the idea development, the product development, the essential plans and the aim and fire are all uh, around a core business that you need to develop for your product as you're moving forward, because a product is not a business and you need both of them to be successful. Okay, so we have our first question okay. and it is, is it difficult to get NPN for a new innovative food supplements, is it a real obstacle? NPN. I'm not Wait. sure. Um, could you please clarify what you meant by NPN? I'm assuming natural product, yeah. Okay. Natural product number, okay, yeah. So is it difficult to get a natural product number for food supplement, is it an obstacle? Well, it's not something that I have a lot of expertise in, uh, I'll admit right off, uh, up front here, but I do know that it's uh, a bit more work. Um, it requires probably some more food safety regulations and your facility probably needs to be at a higher standard. And it probably is going to be a bit more of a challenge to get that number. Um, but once you do get that number, it's going to open up uh, markets that aren't available to other people, it will be a competitive advantage. And you just have to weigh whether it's worth doing that or the investment uh, to make it worthwhile. So Emily, maybe you have a little more um, thought on that. Yeah, um, I don't know if I'd use the word obstacle, but it is definitely time consuming. Um, and you have to really put in a lot of work to get to the, the natural product status. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's an obstacle in a way if you're not willing to put in the time and effort, um, but it is definitely possible. And there are consultants out there that specialize specifically in this category because of that. Um, so we'll take the next question here and it is, uh, what is the acceptable, oh, this is from a last webinar, but we can answer it again. Um, what is the acceptable retail margin when wholesaling products to retailers? The acceptable retail margin? Yeah. Well, that will depend on the product um, going into a, a particular category. Each category will, will be a little bit different. Like meat is, um, I think, around 20 to 25% margin is what um, in a meat category. In produce, it could be 35 to maybe up to 50%. If you're starting to look at deli goods, that they're probably going to be a minimum of 35% uh, you know, to 50% anyway margin or even higher in lots of cases. So it's important to check out these margins. They're different with different stores for sure and 
and different types of stores. Like, I mean, when you have uh, no frills stores, the margins are probably going to be smaller or different um, than they are in other places. But it's important to check with your retailers, the people that you're selling to, and see if they'll share some of that, that information. Or you can sometimes you can work it backwards. So if you know what products are selling for, use your profit wheel. Uh, or your your calculate margin calculating formulas, you can you can figure out what the what the margins are to um, often. So, yep. And to the person who asked that, um, Gary and I actually did a webinar just on pricing for profit and understanding margins, and that is on our YouTube channel as well. It was from our previous series called "Take Your Product to Market," um, and that's online. It was a whole hour just on that information. So I recommend you go back and play that one. And I think that shared uh, slide that had some some standard uh, margin percentages there. Yep. Um, so another question is, as a farmer's market, are there ways we can support our vendors, build a business plan or other pieces in their business development? Could you just say that question again, please? Yep. As a farmer's market, are there ways we can support our vendors, build a business plan or other pieces in their business development? I think so. Um, I think that the farmer's market is, it's almost like the umbrella business plan for, for all these other vendors that you're going to have. So to be able to go down and help them build a business plan, it doesn't have to be a super complicated business plan. It's almost like this business model that we, I was sharing with you today if the farmer's market has sort of a bigger um, umbrella business plan of where the market's going, then if you had a business model for each of your vendors and how they fit into that business plan, I think that would be very useful for both the vendors and the market to be able to see where the gaps are and to see where um, they basically can add, add vendors, add services, and to help people be more profitable in the long term. Great. Another question here is, how do I know what are the essential registrations I must have? And I'm going to make an assumption you're leading maybe towards the food safety um, regulations. And that is if you're on a, a commodity item, which is meat or produce, um, there's regulations for those specifically. And then other than that, retailers will have specific food safety registrations they're looking for. So like some retailers will specifically ask for BRC or SQF or any of the food safety programs. Um, so it's being in good contact with the retailer you're looking at and knowing what kind of food safety plan they will be looking for. Uh, the next question here is what is the accepted increased margin that the consumer will have to sit to pay to sell products, i.e. organic, gluten-free, vegan, et cetera, certifications. So what is the accepted margin that the consumer would pay if for organic products and, and natural products? Yeah, so what's the acceptable increased margin that the consumer will have to pay for a premium product? Well, I'm not sure there's, there's uh, any defined acceptable margin. Um, I think what you have to look at is if you're just focusing on price, it's going to be a bit of a challenge sometimes. What you're trying to look at here is if you're selling natural products, you're selling organic products, like you're selling a higher value product to somebody. So if you're not marketing and presenting the values that you're sending and, and the benefits of those values to the customer, and you're not presenting those, there's going to be a resistance to pay more. But there definitely should be a premium. Um, the customer should be prepared to pay more. But what you're finding over the years is that um, people, the, the price between organic and natural and regular products, the gap is, is shrinking. And it's as maybe natural production practices are, are becoming used more, more uh, widely. And uh, as organic products are, are become, people are be, becoming more aware of them. We have to always look in the food world that it's very competitive. It's always very competitive out there. And I think if you want to get a better price for your products, you're best focusing on your customers, building relationships with those customers, helping them understand the real true value of it. Because most people don't really, 
they hear organic and they, they hear natural, but they don't, don't often really know the benefits, uh, the, the real benefits of what could be shared with them. So it's a bit of a challenge and I'm not trying to skirt the question here, but you know, easily, you know, uh, you'll see 10 or 20% more. Uh, it, you know, if you go in the grocery store and you just look at the difference between organic produce and, and regular produce, then you're seeing what's the gap that uh, people are prepared to pay. And that's probably what it is. But personally, when I go into a store, um, it's more like I look at how good it's going to taste. What's the value to me? What's the n nutritional value? Maybe if I think about it um, and then price sort of becomes second, you're not, your product isn't for everybody um, and even organic products like, you know, not everybody is going to recognize the value. They're not going to be willing to pay for that value, but you want to find those people that are. So hopefully that's helped a little bit there. Yeah. And um, I like something you said before in a different um, webinar, Gary, but um, even just doing like displays with your customers and having them taste it and explaining right. it and saying, what would you be willing to pay? Um, before right. do launch it. Right. That's, That's a, a great way. Yep. Yeah. Um, and one more question here. We do have a few more minutes. So if you have a question, please submit it now. Um, but the last question here right now is, is it a good idea to rely on affiliate marketing to promote my product? It depends on what your product is. Uh, and I think affiliates can help you move your product into the marketplace more. Um, you're doing it in a sense when you sell your product at a grocery store or whatever, they're, they're an affiliate uh, that is helping you reach a larger market. Affiliates help you get in front of more people. And uh, so if you can use those people to do it at a reasonable cost, I mean, there's a cost to using a agent. There's a cost to using a broker. There's cost to using a wholesaler or distributor or to, using a retailer to get to that consumer. You just have to decide how much you're prepared to, um, to spend and if it's going to get you the results that you want. Great. Okay, no other questions came in, so we'll just close it off here. So thanks okay. Gary for presenting today and teaching us all about the essential plans required for the product launch. If your question wasn't answered during this session or you think of one later, please see Gary and I's contact information. Perfect, we're back on that screen. Um, feel free to email us your questions using the subject line idea to market webinar, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. However, this was the third part of a four part series. So please join Gary and I again next Thursday for the final session of this webinar series. Um, as I mentioned before, the first two are online on our YouTube channel, so you can catch up there if you haven't seen them. And I will include a link to that in my email this afternoon. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. The next webinar for this series is on a launch strategy and checklist to keep your products on the shelf. You can find information for this webinar on Perennia's online learning page. Thanks a lot for coming and we'll see you next week. Thanks very much.